The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. This is eConversations, a joint production of Troy Trojan Vision and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Now, here's your host, Dr. Dan Sutter. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Karl Marx is one of the most well-known scholars uh, of, of recent years, of recent centuries, actually. His influence can be seen today uh, all across the higher education, all across many different fields of, of higher uh, education in, in the academy. And we can hear echoes of his theory of exploitation in uh, critical race theory, it is a, a subject that's gotten a, a lot of attention uh, recently. And yet, when he wrote, as an economist, when he wrote, his uh, work did not immediately change the uh, economics profession. In fact, it never really had a tremendous in impact on economics. And his work seemed to be fading into obscurity after his death in the 1880s. Until, that ha until the, the Russian Revolution came along in 1917, when some devotees of Marx, uh, led by uh, Vladimir Lenin, managed to seize power and was, at the time, the largest nation in the world and, and one of the, the most powerful nations in the world. And they set up a, a, Soviet, a, set up a, a socialist, uh, communist nation in, inspired by Marx and Marx's writings and brought a, a great scholarly attention all of a sudden back to, to Marx. So was Marx really a great scholar whose ideas were so powerful that they've uh, uh, should surely be enlightening, enlightening insight all across uh, the social sciences uh, today? Or was his popularity, his surge in popularity, really sort of more a, a product of this historical accident of some of his uh, followers actually su uh, staging a successful revolution? Here to talk about his research on this topic today is Dr. Phil Magnus of the American Institute for e Economic Research. Dr. Magnus earned a, a PhD in public policy from George Mason University, and he's written numerous uh, articles and, and books. A, a couple of his previous books, uh, Cracks in the Ivory Tower and the 1619 Project, a critique, he has uh, discussed about with me on this show. So welcome back to the show, Phil. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let, let's get into this. Uh, tell us a little bit about... Uh, First, so tell us a little bit about Marx and, and his uh, most famous writings. Obviously, Das Kapital, amongst uh, economists, is one we're familiar with, and then uh, the Communist Manifesto, and and uh, some of the the measures by which we can see how much of a, how much influence Marx has today. Right. right. So Karl Marx is uh, a uh, an economist and philosopher in the 19th century. Uh, dies in 1883 and published several uh, works in his lifetime and, and even more after his life was edited by his colleague Frederick Engels and put into print and then several subsequent successors. Uh, so voluminous uh, writer, but uh, he was not uh, terribly influential in his own day. Uh, he was known among the radical left of uh, labor activism as one socialist theorist, but he was also uh, someone that was very prone to fighting with other socialists. Mm -hmm. So uh, he lived in a very schismatic world on the very periphery of the extreme left of the political spectrum. Now, yeah. where is he today? Marx is all over the place in universities. He's one of the most frequently assigned authors in uh, college classrooms. Uh, Communist Manifesto is always near the top of the list of philosophical works. It's up there usually above Plato's Republic, and then nothing else even comes close to it. Uh, he's also one of the most influential uh, figures that's cited in the humanities and certain social sciences uh, of all time. He uh, has a like a massive uh, citation index if you look in several fields uh, outside of economics. So he's a big deal today. But although his uh, his work is very influential now, again, like you said, he passed away in 1883. And uh, in the decades after that, it seemed like he, there, there's pretty good evidence his, his work was sort of uh, disappearing into obscurity. His, uh, cap, we can talk a little bit about why, why that yeah. was. 
And uh, one thing, as you know, is like he, although he's had this tremendous impact across the humanities and social sciences, he's never had a, a tremendous impact in, in economics. So l let's talk about both of these. Like, why were economists apparently not as as uh, taken with his work as uh, some others? Yeah. So, so his most famous book, uh, Das Kapital, is published in 1867. And if you, if you go through the book, it lays out a theoretical argument that's built on something we refer to as the labor theory of value. Uh, labor performed to improve something is what instills it with value. And he takes this and he runs with it. Uh, so Marx uh, begins with the labor theory of value. It didn't originate with him. This has been something economists have been talking about for centuries. But he absorbs that as his starting point. And he basically points out, he says that uh, you know, laborers earn a certain level in income. But we also know that uh, the owners of the factories sell the goods that they produce at a much higher level. And if you take the difference between the two, it's often quite large. And he refers to this as surplus value. And he says surplus value is basically ill-gotten gains that the owners of capital, the factory owners, have taken away from the people that actually perform the work uh, and basically derives a theory of exploitation from this. Mm -hmm. And this is the mechanism that drives Marxian theory forward, eventually revolution comes among the proletarian worker class as a result of being exploited, having uh, the fruits of their labor taken away from them. Uh, so the goal of the socialist revolution is to rise up, seize the means of production, and reclaim that surplus value. So this entire system is built on the labor theory of value. Now this was published in 1867, but we also know from the history of economics that in 1871, uh, an event occurs, we now refer to as the marginal revolution. Uh, there was a series of uh, simultaneous discoveries by Carl Menger in Austria and uh, William Stanley Jevons in the UK, where they came up with a an alternative theory of value that actually had empirical validation for it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the subjective or marginal theory of value. Value does not derive based on the work performed on something. It value, the value derives at the moment of the exchange relative to the next unit that could be exchanged and is deeply, deeply influenced by the subjective preferences of the two parties to the exchange. Mm -hmm. So the labor theory of value is basically discarded only four years after Marx writes this magnum opus built around the labor theory of value. What this means is in the decades following his death, all economists that engage with them, they read his work, and they're basically saying, yeah, this is an obsolete theory. Yeah. It's wrong. It's built around an erroneous theory of value. Uh, we've since moved beyond that. So why are we paying attention to it? Right. Yeah. So then, then we have, obviously, uh, we have the Russian Revolution come along. And, uh, so, and so it's possible to think about, like, well, maybe that had some impact. Because clearly Lenin it was, had read and studied Marx and was being uh, motivated by Marxist uh, thinking. And so you've investigated this with a, a, a paper that's uh, now, now been published in a, very, uh, in a truly leading e economic journal, uh, the Journal of Political Economy. So uh, tell us a little bit about this uh, the paper, uh, this is your co-author, and then, then we'll get into how you went about trying to, to test this idea that maybe it was the Russian Revolution and not the, the power and insight of Marx's uh, ideas that l have led him to be uh, such a well-known scholar today. Exactly. So uh, this paper basically began with a conversation between myself and my co-author, Michael McCovey, who's at uh, Northwood University. Uh, and we were looking at um, some data, some statistics, uh, using the Google Ngram database. And we get into a little bit of what that entails. But we noticed a, a very interesting just observational trend that Marx's name is not mentioned very often in printed works uh, in his lifetime. Certainly, he's, he's a, a relatively obscure figure. Uh, maybe other socialists are referring to them. There are socialist pamphlets that uh, critique and engage with him. And then there are a few economists that uh, basically attack him for having an incorrect theory of value. But that's about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this period lasts from roughly his lifetime until the early 1910s. And then all of a sudden, starting in 1917, you see references to Marx skyrocket. They're everywhere. Uh, they're in contemporary newspapers and books. Uh, they spill over into academic works. And, uh, you know, here we are a century later. Marx is one of the most cited figures in all of uh, human history. Uh, so it's a very interesting trend that he, he loved, uh, hovers at a very low level of reference in print material 
uh, from basically his death until 1916, and then overnight he takes off. So we got this theory, uh, uh, and the theory was that basically the Soviet Union must have put marks on the map. And this isn't an original theory to us. People have, in qualitative research, uh, observed this before across the political spectrum. So the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises mentions it in a series of lectures he gave in the 1940s. But also on the other end of the spectrum, the Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm comes up with the same theory. He says that Marx was relatively unknown in his day, and it was really the Soviet Union that put him on the map. Uh, so several other scholars have uh, posited this as an explanation of why Marx is so prominent today. It's He, he gained basically the uh, credibility boost that came from the Soviet Union successfully executing a revolution uh, made him a salient figure in the intellectual scene as well. And basically all that we've seen on Marxist scholarship since then is built on that boost, not on things that he did in his own lifetime. And here's a, a table from your, with some data from your paper showing you sort of your, your point of like, Marx was not highly regarded. This is some journal, journal article mentions of, of some different economists. And mm -hmm. as we can see there, like well, Marx was certainly not out in the lead. Uh, relative to Adam Smith, he's well behind. Adam Smith being the, the yeah. founder of uh, economics. Uh, and you know, we're, uh, one of his contemporaries would have been Henry George. And you see he's being right, referenced right. about equal to Henry George. And, and, and my, you know, although we as uh, economists know who Henry George is, uh, you know, probably a, a name that completely is, is not know, known by many uh, Americans today. Exactly, exactly. And George was probably the closest competitor to Marx on that list, which is one of the reasons why we looked at him. Uh, you know, Henry George was uh, an ascendant figure in the late 19th century, and he actually ends up in some of our other metrics. He's actually more famous than Marx in Marx's lifetime. Uh, but today he's considered just a, a pretty obscure figure that has a very niche history of economic thought following and a few uh, schools of thought that follow him, but they're not uh, anywhere near the mainstream of the conversation. And then the other thing we noticed is we started to look across academic journals there, and Marx is mentioned in certain journals, but it's almost all concentrated in things like the economic journal, in the quarterly journal of economics, uh, in uh, journals that had a focus on questions like the theory of value and the labor theory of value. And these were uh, uh, venues that were engaging and critiquing Karl Marx. Uh, whereas if you look at things like the Journal of Education, he's almost non-existent there. The Journal of Law, uh, very limited uh, historical presence, very limited presence in, in literature and English. And yet these are the fields today where Marx is cited everywhere and he's almost never cited in the economics journal. So we've kind of reversed the entire pattern that's shown by this table. So let's get into some of the details of how you went about uh, trying to, to test this. Because in, in it begins, you mentioned Google n-grams. But uh, yeah. explain for us uh, what that is and how this is a, a great new uh, a tool that, you can, that we can use in research now. Yeah. So Google very famously has scanned entire libraries of uh, major universities and put them into an online searchable text index. Now, you can't get uh, full access to them because some are under copyright still, but uh, their goal is to uh, uh, text scan basically the entirety of human knowledge. And they started with English language sources, but they've since expanded to about a dozen other languages. Uh, the most recent update in 2019, there are some estimates that say uh, in the neighborhood of 10, maybe even 20% of all books ever uh, that have ever been written and published have now been scanned in some form or another by Google. And what Google does with Ngrams is uh, they basically set up a, uh, uh, an online tool where you can search any name or phrase or word or group of, of words together, and it will calculate how many times those phrases or words or names appear in a given set of text relative to all other books that they've scanned for that year. Mm -hmm. So you can get, uh, if you search the name Karl Marx, it'll give you basically uh, the equivalent of a percentage of how many uh, times Marx is mentioned relative to all the books that they've scanned for that year. And you can do this with any name, any phrase, any uh, wording, and you can start to see the patterns as they change over time. Uh, so it became a really interesting tool because we observed one of the first things we did when we embarked on this project is we observed that spike in 1917 around Karl Marx's name. Yeah, so we have this up here now, and, and if you're, you're looking at this, 
we have two lines there, but right now what we're focusing on in is, is the solid line because that, that's the yeah. actual number of the uh, citations to marks from this uh, Google Ngrams. And you say, well, maybe it was uh, trending up a little bit, a little bit higher in, in the years before 1917 than uh, uh, back to the 1880s, but there's a, a huge jump there. And, and, and wow. so there's certainly, there's, there's see, you, you see it there in the data. But as economists, especially when we go about trying to do our research, even if you see something in the data, we have to be skeptical. And yeah. we have to try to ask the question of, well, could it have been you know, could have happened for some other reason? And and one thing you could look at, or particularly or wonder, is was there something that drove a, a lot of different uh, authors to be cited a lot more, to say after 1917? You know, the World War that was ending, and maybe people were writing a lot about what the post-war world should be like, and so maybe lots yeah. of maybe lots of other uh, authors started to get a lot more mention, or you know, maybe libraries became more efficient, or, or whatever it might be. There, there could be other explanations. And so yeah. to try to explore this further, you use a, a, a strong empirical technique that's been relatively recently uh, devised by uh, economists and other social scientists to study this. It's called synthetic control. So tell us a little bit what, what's involved with that. Yeah, yeah, so synthetic control is basically a way of matching trend lines up until a point, a treatment date. So our treatment date is built around this hypothesis that the Soviet Union puts marks on the map. It causes a huge spike in his citations. And we see that visibly in the Ngram data for marks. But to test it, we also got to look at the counterfactuals, like you mentioned. Is there something else going on? So what we did is we data scraped the Ngram database off of Google and put together a list of 225 other authors that were either contemporaries of Marx, so basically writing at the same time as him, uh, to and then anyone earlier than that. So we go all the way back to like the ancient world with Plato and Aristotle and figures like that. But uh, names that are basically considered part of the intellectual canon. And then we also augmented that with looking at other socialist figures, so people that were contemporary debaters of Marx that had competing camps in the socialist world. They may have been pretty obscure themselves, uh, kind of like Marx, but they were trying to uh, fighting it out to be uh, the leader of the socialist movement in Marx's lifetime. Uh, so we, we put together this database, 225 names, plus Karl Marx of all their yearly engrams. And what synthetic control does is it basically runs a computer algorithm and it tries to match the other authors in that database to Karl Marx prior to 1917. For every year uh, from when we start our, our synthetic control in 1878 to 1916, the computer is trying to get the best fit from uh, weighted uh, numbers that come out of all of those other 225 authors. And what it'll do, it'll select others that match Karl Marx's citation patterns over that period of time. And uh, it eventually generates a fit that we can subject to, uh, uh, to all sorts of testing. Uh, we can look for statistical significance. And what we're trying to detect is what would happen if this supposed uh, positive event, this treatment, this 1917 event had never happened. Mm -hmm. Or what if Lenin's uh, uh, attempt at revolution had been quashed and then he right. faded away into obscurity? What would have continued? Well, the, the premise here is that Marx would have continued to track all of the authors that fit uh, his trend line the closest prior to 1917. And that's what gives us the synthetic counterfactual that we can project forward into the future using the authors that fit Marx the closest. Right, yeah, because the idea would be the, these people fit Marx up until 1916. So whatever it was, uh, they, they, they were following quite along, but they did not have their disciples uh, take over a major right. country. <laughs> take over a country. <laughs> and, and so if, if you see a divergence as emerges after that, then you know, we can at least have some confidence to say that it was that, that event as opposed to other economic or social forces that, that was causing it. And you know, the, if you look at this uh, graph here, we've got the dashed line up there, and we can see that, yeah, the, the, uh, the dashed line diverges significant. The dashed line does not right. jump, take a huge jump. Right, it, it just continues along at, at roughly the same uh, level. It's, uh, uh, in a, and it's relatively low. I mean, it's basically hovering the same place it was in the late 19th century. Uh, and some of these figures that uh, are, are composites of that dashed line, we do still study them to get it today, yeah. but we study them in the same way we study Henry George or some very obscure socialist figures in the history of economic thought. It's not like Karl Marx, the actual citations that have just taken off. Yeah, and, and this is just the uh, uh, 
the list of the authors that you have included in, in this are the people who sort of see, I mean, it includes, uh, LaSalle was a, a socialist writer as well, but then, yeah. like, you know, you, you include people like Oscar Wilde and, and uh, Abraham Lincoln, e even, because up until 1916, uh, the citations to their uh, names or their, their work were, were, were tracking Marx quite similarly. Right, right. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a composite. All this adds up to basically 100%. So these are the weights of all the different figures, their citation patterns. And the really interesting thing is that the two biggest weights, so uh, more than half comes from Ferdinand LaSalle, and then uh, uh, a little over a quarter comes from uh, Johann Karl Robertus. And this makes sense. LaSalle and Robertus were two uh, socialist competitors to Karl Marx. They were probably precursors to what we call the democratic socialist tradition, whereas Marx is the revolutionary socialist tradition. Uh, they, they were writing around the same time as him, and they had their own groups of followers that clashed with the Marxists in the socialist world. Uh, but the other interesting thing is LaSalle, Rodbertus, and Marx basically all hated each other. Uh, they, they, they agreed on socialist ideals of certain sorts, and they interacted in the same circles, but uh, uh, Robertus' followers, for example, accused Marx of plagiarizing the theory of surplus value from him. Ferdinand LaSalle and Marx had a very notoriously fractured relationship that involved uh, uh, some, some very vicious name-calling and denunciations of each other as competitor socialists. So yeah. it makes sense that those are the heaviest weights. And then the other weights you start to see uh, uh, are other figures from the 19th century that were just tracking that general trajectory prior to 1917. And, and then you uh, continue this just for you know uh, purposes of il illustration uh, out to the, the present essentially, and you can sure enough see, yeah, this is the same pattern as before. The, the real Karl Marx starts getting cited a lot more than the synthetic Karl Marx, and so yeah, the, yeah the, it, this pattern exactly. it wasn't just transitory maybe during the uh, early Soviet Union; it, it continues since then. Of course, we know that because Marx gets, we, we know Marx is cited. A tremendous amount today, but certainly a lot more than the uh, the, the control group would have been. Absolutely, absolutely. No. Yeah, and, and you can see that uh, uh, you know that, that composite of all the other authors, it stays relatively flat across the century. Yeah. Now, I want to caution against projecting all the way a century later because there are many other intervening events that occurred right. here. Uh, but we see clearly that this is the split. Nineteen seventeen is uh, the, the 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 point where the two lines diverge. And it's a very pronounced divergence that just continues ever since then. Yeah, and you know, so what we can talk about a little bit further is like you know, you do a number of additional tests because for our research, you know, that, that this this becomes critically important. People are going to want to know: is there anything else that could be explaining right. this other than than what you're alleging? Because if there is, then we don't want you to be able to sort of improperly allege that, that, that it was the Russian Revolution when something else could explain it. So you, you do a whole bunch of different tests, and then you also actually test to try and see if there's a statistical st significance here. Could we have seen something like this happen just uh, by, by random chance? So uh, tell us briefly about some of these other things you, you, you use to try to, to, to rule out a, as possible explanations. Yeah, yeah so, so we, we ran a whole series of robust, robustness checks to make sure that our, our results were in fact what we thought they were. Uh, and this included, uh, so one of the first ones we did, uh, Google Ngrams only uses books, so scanned library books. The question comes up, well, what about newspapers? What about periodicals? Uh, so we set up a computer scraping uh, program that scanned over newspaper databases, so historical scans of, uh, of the daily New York Times all the way down to the uh, Peoria Express News or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and we looked across these newspaper databases, scraped the same type of data for mentions of the name as a percentage of all newspapers that had been scanned for that year, and we replicated our study. And we independently found basically more or less the same thesis. Uh, mm -hmm. Marx is a relatively obscure figure until 1917, and then suddenly he's all over the newspapers. So there was one check that we did. Uh, we also uh, segmented up our authors, so we, uh, we ran the test over again by excluding other socialists, and then we limited it to socialists only, and these are two ways to kind of triangulate mm -hmm. to figure out that yes, indeed, Marx is pulling away from the, the rest of the pack of other socialist thinkers, uh, and that, that again came up with uh, some very strong results. And then we asked the question, well, what happened in languages other than English? Because mm -hmm. English is by far the biggest part of the Ingram uh, database. It's the... Uh, 
uh, the language that most scholarly works are published in. But Karl Marx also wrote in German. Mm -hmm. So uh, we looked at the German language in Graham database and then subsequently a German language newspaper database to figure out if the same trend could be observable. And it turns out, yes, it is. So we do German language in Graham. Uh, he's again following the same pattern of relatively low uh, levels of citation, uh, matching some fairly obscure other socialist figures. 1917, he skyrockets. He shoots up in German language tests. But Germany does something very interesting, very uh, very different. This kind of uh, validated our theory as well. Uh, so Ger German Karl Marx citations continue to increase throughout the 1920s until 1932, 1933. Then they suddenly reverse and drop back down toward that uh, trend line from the composite of the other authors. This is very obviously explained by one thing. That the year that Hitler came to power, mm -hmm. and what did Hitler do? He censored opposition political works, including Karl Marx. And then in 1946, after Germany's been defeated in World War II, there's a Marxist state that's proclaimed in East Germany right. by the Soviet Union, and suddenly Marxist citations shoot off again in German. So yeah. we have a triple treatment effect occurring in German that validates this original observation. It's, it's really the Soviet Union that's driving it, and it's other political events that have changed the trend. So uh, by, do, by running these other tests, we basically tried to eliminate alternative hypotheses, alternative explanations that might have otherwise uh, uh, told us why Marxist citations took off. And, and we found some very robust results that all triangulate and point back to this one thing. It's the Russian Revolution. It's the Soviet Union. Well, we just have a couple minutes left, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the implications of this. And one you mentioned earlier, and, and that because a couple of the uh, writers in the synthetic Marx were other socialists, and, and as you mentioned, like relative to Marx, other socialists writing in the 1800s uh, or early 1900s were not all advocating for a violent uh, revolution right. as, as a way to bring socialism about, and. You know, that, that's one of the possibilities. If Marx had remained one of many different socialist voices, you know, may, maybe uh, proponents of people who saw some value in from each according to uh, ability to each according <laughs> to need might have pursued a different, say, more peaceful path uh, to, to power in, in the 20th century. And, and maybe some of the, the horrors that we observed with uh, communism where, where Marx's ideas, wherever they were uh, implemented, maybe some of that, would, that history would have been different. Absolutely. So one of the uh, the effects that we discern from uh, our data and several of these robustness checks is Marx basically crowded out all of his competitors in the socialist world. Uh, mm -hmm. These are people that were uh, basically tracking him in similar citation patterns uh, prior to 1917. Many of them were his contemporaries, and they had their own factions debating each other. And, uh, it, you know, it's an open question. Would one or more of these other competing socialists have become the dominant figures in the socialist tradition had it not been for Lenin. And mm -hmm. we also know from Lenin, Lenin was very explicitly drawn to Marx because Marx embraced revolution, where some of these other thinkers uh, said that's off the table, violence is wrong. So uh, yes, yeah, so you get a very different path that could have occurred had Lenin not been successful. Well, thanks so much for coming on and talking about this. Is a, I found this to be a, a tremendously uh, enlightening uh, uh, a paper to read. So thanks again so much for coming on, and thank you all for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations. This has been eConversations, a joint production of Troy Trojan Vision and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. 